Jesus claims to be the only way to God, and that's the gospel message. This exclusive claim leads, often leads skeptics and atheists and also thoughtful Christians to ask, well, if hearing about Jesus is necessary for salvation, then what about those that never hear the gospel? And this, this topic or this question is also called the soteriolo soteriological problem of the unevangelized. So it has to do with salvation, and a lot of other issues fall into this. So by unevangelized, oh, that's a big QR code if you couldn't get it on your phone. Does anybody want to do it? Ah, it's real big. Zach made it so good. Look at the little dinosaur in, in the middle. Okay. <laughs> Who are the unevangelized? By that term, I mean modern persons, post-Christ, who never hear of Jesus. So, for example... I'm not in this category because I was here last week and I heard the gospel from Jackson, okay? Um, so the, according to Lausanne website, and the Lausanne organization was formed in like 1974 with the purpose of promoting global and um, world evangelism. John Stott was one of the big promoters of this and, and there was some, have y'all ever heard of the Lausanne Covenant? Okay, never mind. But on that website, they keep track of unreached people groups, okay? So there are 2.1 billion people have little or no gospel access, and that's like today. Um, the largest unreached people groups are in what's called the 1040 window, that's that rectangle, and that's between 10 degrees north and 40 degrees north latitude. Some of these countries also just restrict sharing the gospel, so you can't even get the you can't have mission, missionaries can't go there and there's no gospel access. Um, so our question regarding the destiny of the unevangelized is meant to put Christians on the hook for, uh, to come up with a response because it seems like Christianity has contradictory claims. So we have a friend named Alvin, he's Alvin the atheist, and he has a friend named Carol the Christian. And we can imagine that Alvin would have this question, just like we're discussing tonight, about the unevangelized. And he might say, look, here's how it is. If the gospel is necessary for salvation, then the unevangelized who don't hear, they're damned. And punishing people for what they could not have known is inconsistent with a loving and just God. Therefore, Christianity must be false. Okay, that's how he might say it. And, you know, Carol needs to have some sort of response. There are a lot of responses <laughs> for Alvin, and because this question is not new, it's been asked for 2,000 plus years, and we're gonna find out that some of these views have been held by ancient proponents and modern proponents now. So the first response, this is just a brief overview. The ones highlighted are the ones we're gonna focus on tonight. Agnosticism is a common response, and you may have heard that. And all, all that would be is that we can't draw conclusions because God hasn't explicitly told us in the, God, in, in, the, in the Bible what he's going to do with the unevangelized. And so it's a view of humility, really. It's saying that we don't know. It's intellectual humility, which I'm all for. And in debatable issues, you have to have humility, right? Because there's not dogmatic conclusions that you can come to. But another important virtue is um, intellectual honesty and courage, because we have to face potential inconsistency. If we have a potential inconsistency, inconsistency in our belief system, we need to sort it out. Right? We need to face it and we need to maybe um, dig a little deeper than just saying we can't know. And so we kind of hand wave it away. And also Alvin the atheist is gonna wanna know something more from us. Because Alvin, remember, he's a pretty smart guy. He doesn't wanna have any false beliefs. He's, he's a radical skeptic, um, he's thoughtful, so he doesn't hold any false beliefs, but what that puts him in is he doesn't have any true beliefs either. He's, he's kind of, he's out there, he doesn't hold any false beliefs, but he's restricted himself so much that he doesn't have any true beliefs. So we want to help him out. The second view is inclusivism, 
And that salvation is possible apart from evangelization. So people can um, be saved apart from the gospel. And post-mortem evangelism is the unevangelized can hear about Christ and accept him after they die. And then universal evangelization is basically it's God will get the, get the message to someone who's seeking him. Okay. God will get the message to them. That's kind of what I call that view. Those three views are what we're going to focus on. There's also universalism, which is ultimately everyone, including the unevangelized, will be saved. The final option view is a Catholic view, and it's that the unevangelized hear the gospel message at the moment of death. So this is not after death, but at the moment of death, they have the opportunity to, to respond to the gospel. There's middle knowledge views, and we can talk about those after. They're interesting. Um, it's, it's based on the, um, that God has middle knowledge before his creative decree of, of counterfactual freedom of creatures, and we can go into the, how that affects the unevangelized later. So the three views we're going to look at, they all agree on two control beliefs that Jesus is the only Savior, and that God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So they come to different conclusions, but these are two things that they hold in common. So we'll call them the boundary beliefs of these three views. Um, I, I have to qualify this. I'm not a theologian, um, but I did a little bit of reading. <laughs> this is what the sources I use for this talk, and three of the books are multiple views books. That's where a proponent gives his view, and then the other authors critique it, and so it's side by side, and you get a, a flavor of what uh, their, their view is and how, how others critique them. The Clarity of God's Existence is a book by um, philosopher Owen Anderson, and it's about general revelation, the clarity of general revelation. I found it extremely interesting. All these you can borrow from me. I have a Lindy, all my books you can, if you have free brain time, which I'm sure you don't. <laughs> but if you get a hankering over the summer, if you want to look at these some more, you can always borrow a book. This, the paper is a William Lane Craig um, essay on middle knowledge. And then The Unseen Realm is by Michael Heiser, and he's, he is a theologian, and I use him for quirky passages and weird passages because he has uh, a background in ancient Near East culture and he puts things in context really well. Okay, so here's our roadmap. Here's our model we're going to use. We're going to um, explain the view in a nutshell. We're going to use, we're going to present their key scriptures that they use to support their view. And then we're going to look at their assumptions, their theological assumptions. And those are what drive their interpretation of scripture. Some of them have the same scripture verses, but they might interpret them differently. Um, we're going to look at ancient and modern proponents, who's had this view in the past and who has it now. And then we're going to evaluate strengths and weaknesses. And then we're going to look at um, Acts 10 and how each view might interpret the account of Cornelius. Does anyone remember um, Cornelius? The, the, account, the, the, the guy, the Roman centurion? Oh, Sam, what? It, it's like a, it's a chain. It's a, like a, well, I did have a chain, but that's a weight. So it's like, it weights them, it, it's... Yeah, it, I guess, why, 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 can you explain it? Yeah. I mean, is it like sort of the thing that you're grounded to? You're grounded, you're, you're that's a good one. Good. That's what it is. He, that was, uh, Zach did my slides up that way. It's all fancy. Okay, so that, does that explain why it's a weight? Okay. They're kind of grounded to those, con those assumptions. Let me just briefly tell you about Cornelius in case you do, so, so you can have it in your mind because every view has an interpretation of this. So remember, Cornelius was a Roman centurion and he did fear God and prayed and gave, did righteous things like give money to the poor. 
And so you could say he had responded to the light he had, but he didn't have the gospel, okay? And one day while he was praying, an angel came to him and said, Cornelius, God hears your prayers and remembers what you've done for the poor. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Peter. And so Peter's in Joppa. He has the gospel, but he doesn't think he's supposed to give it to the Gentiles. But through three visions and the Holy Spirit's prompting, he goes with the men to Cornelius, to uh, this Gentile house, and gives them the gospel. And they're all, Cornelius and his whole household are saved. They receive the Holy Spirit, just like at Pentecost. And um, Peter says this, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears God and does what is right is welcome to him. Okay, and so after Cornelius, the begin this was the beginning of the gospel going to the Gentiles, and Paul does that the rest of Acts. Okay, and so we're gonna we're gonna see how these different views interpret that. But we first have to deal with articulating exclusivism. Now, exclusivism is the view that Alvin is questioning. This is what he's he's got his panties in a wad about, right? Is because this exclusivism is very restrictive about the unevangelized. So to be saved on this view, it's necessary to know about the work of Jesus and exercise faith in him before you die. The, the means of salvation is, is exclusively through human messengers, through missionaries, we would say today. So on your handout, your handy dandy handout, you have their, this scriptural support for exclusivism is what you would think, John 14, 6, Jesus is the only way. Romans 10, faith comes by hearing the good news, and the good news when, is when someone tells you about Christ. And Hebrews 9, 27, that it was appointed unto men once to die. So that, that's the first part. Um, so the main thing to remember about exclusivism is the narrow um, role of general revelation. So remember, the unevangelized don't have the gospel, right? They just have general revelation. So let's define general revelation. Who, know, who, who knows what that is generally? So special revelation is the Bible. What's general revelation? You, in the blue shirt. Creation, the works of, of creation, and also your moral sense, your, you know, your inside information is your moral knowledge. So God says in Romans 1, 18 through 20, that he clearly reveals himself in general revelation by the works of his creation, by our rational capacities to know it, and also concepts like eternity. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says he's put eternity in our hearts. So we have certain concepts we also know, given our human nature. And also moral knowledge. So that's in Romans 2.14. But what the way that exclusivists interpret Romans 1.18 through 20, let's read the first part. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So they, they should know God from general revelation, but they suppress it. And so the other verse they use is Romans 3.11, that also no one seeks God. No one is seeking God, right? That's from Romans 3.11. There's no one who understands, and there's no, no one who seeks God. So for the exclusivists, the way they interpret that is that the unevangelized, the general revelation doesn't save you because there's no, there's no gospel in general revelation. And the unevangelized person, they assume, has suppressed the truth about God, that they don't seek God. So they're condemned for rejecting the light given to them in general revelation. That's the assumption. Okay, was that as clear as mud? Okay, what? <laughs>
Right. But then right there in verse 20, it says, your you know, general revelation exists, so you have no excuse for not being saved, which sort of implies... Well, you, it's not that you don't have, have, it, have, have uh, no excuse for being saved, but you have no excuse for not believing God exists. So what the way that the way it would be said is that we should know God from general revelation because it's clear, but we suppress the truth about that, and we also we don't seek God. So we're not we're not even contemplating that. Um, so not only so so the the way they most often explain it is general revelation is not salvific it only condemns okay so it's a narrow view of general revelation and i think the weakness we're going to look at this the 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 strength of exclusivism is that it does stress that jesus is the only savior right and it emphasizes missions because you can only reach the unevangelized through human messengers but the 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 con, if you want to do, you know, the plus or the minus is that salvation is not universally accessible on this view, right? It's not, it, it's not universally accessible. So, the, so that's what Alvin is, is, is objecting to. And as far as Cornelius, they would say Cornelius was saved after responding to the gospel when Peter came. Uh, and had he, let's just say, had he died before Peter arrived, he would have not been saved. Are you, okay? <laughs> that, that's, ba that's basically the gist of Cornelius. So he would not have been saved had he died before he heard the gospel. Okay? So any questions on clarification for exclusive? You can see why that's the targeted view, right? And why... Uh, the next three views are all evangelical views trying to put together the fact somehow that salvation is universally accessible, okay? Both, all three of the next views are going to take a stab at trying to put the, that claim in there, okay? Okay. Yes? when you mean by universally accessible, it's not universal as a name that everybody opportunity okay. that they that they that they can can accept or reject but it's not universalism that's correct regardless of like external circumstances like someone coming to evangelize to you is that what we mean by the universally accessible well you, we're going to find out how they're going to explain that okay. how how it could be that an unevangelized person could be saved without hearing the gospel right that's the next view yeah ben so i have a question that may be better for discussion on this yeah Yeah, yeah. And so the exclusivists would say they're not damned for rejecting Christ because they hadn't heard about Christ. They're damned for their unbelief in God by not examining general revelation and believing that God exists. Okay? So it's a little bit different. It's not that you're damned for not believing in Jesus. You're, it's more about uh, the, you haven't responded to the light given to you in general revelation. And they're assuming that you don't. That's the, and so that's that narrow view that no one seeks and no one can know God from general revelation. Okay. And there's, pushing back on that a bit, as to another question that might be both participating in the discussion again. Um, if, would you, is it possible on this view to have somebody that if the gospel were, real, were revealed to them, sort of counterfactually? So they, the gospel wasn't revealed to them. Right. So that's kind of a middle knowledge view, right? Is that what you're, uh, that, that's wrapped up in the middle knowledge view. Yeah, I'm getting on, I'm, I'm getting on to, the, to the case where somebody... Reject, I, actually, so you're trying to separate someone's response to general revelation and their response to the gospel, right? right. And actually, I, I wouldn't try to separate them all that much because I think they're tied together. 
although. I mean, they're not the same, right. but they're tied together. Right. No, there is a there is definitely a distinction. One is we can only know that God exists. But I think as far as a person, if a person rejects everything about God, right? Um, it seem it's you know you're 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 saying a person rejects if they have unbelief in God, but that but then they're saved. And I would say that in their salvation they then do have belief in God. So. And, and the general revelation is made clear. If they were. So, in, in other words, uh, if they don't believe in God, they're not going to believe that Jesus is God because they don't believe in God. <laughs> I think they're tied together is all I'm saying. But um, I, know, I, don't, I know people who be separated and say, well, they can, they can disregard general revelation and then be saved. But I think in that, in that second part of that, the, the, you're subsuming the first part with it at that point. Even yeah, if they so had rejected it before. If they were to, if, if they are rejecting general revelation, they would still reject the gospel if it were presented to them. It's possible not. I mean, I, I can see, but it would be a package deal. You wouldn't, if you, if you received the gospel, you wouldn't still reject general revelation. Do you right. understand what I'm saying? So it's yeah. kind of a package deal in the second, in the second case. Okay, did we just lose it? Are we totally gone? It's a good discussion, Yes. Clarification? Question? I was saying I'm good. Oh, you're good. You're good. Oh, thank you. Okay. So let's go on to a response then that Carol can give. One of the responses Carol can can give Alvin is inclusivism. And so in a nutshell, somebody go to So in a nutshell, God saves people because of the work of Christ. So on the basis of Christ's atonement, God saves people. But it's not necessary to know who Jesus is. Like Hebrews 11, 6 says, The one who has faith must believe God exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So they would disagree with the exclusivists who say that no one seeks God. They would say, yes, left to ourselves we don't seek God, but the Holy Spirit is drawing people to seek God all universally. Universal outreach, you would say. Yes. I feel like using the Holy Spirit is strange there if you're trying to convince an atheist, right? Because they don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Well, so in, in this note, we're not making a case for the Holy Spirit because this is an internal consistency with Christianity that he's asking the Christian to resolve. So he doesn't even believe the gospel, right? So he's just saying your gospel and your God are conflicting. You need to have a way to put them together, and I need to hear your, your right? So he wouldn't even believe that God exists. So he it's obviously not going to believe in the Holy Spirit. But he still wants to hear how you would harmonize. He wants to know if your belief system is consistent or not contradictory. Holding, holding inconsistent belief, obviously inconsistent belief it, is probably worse. Right. Yeah. So that's a, a deal breaker for him. If your belief system is totally contradictory, he's, still, he's not going to be on board at all. Right. So that's, that's what that's about. Um, so all those other verses about you will seek me and find me, God, God is saying, if you seek me, you will find me. Um, Luke 15 has parables that illustrate that God is, look, is seeking the lost person. So the lost sheep, the lost coin, the prodigal son, all those parables are God seeking the lost. And then um, they use Acts 10, they use Cornelius as an example. Uh, and so the way they distinguish Cornelius is, Cornelius was a believer in God, and then when Peter came, he became a Christian. So they distinguish between believer and Christian. Um, and also they would put unevangelized today in modern times equivalent to Old Testament um, believers who had a lim who didn't know Jesus but knew you know knew there was a coming messiah a promised messiah or savior that they had faith in God to be the mediator Sam this kind of makes me think of um, the the statue to the unknown god yes um, almost the idea that somebody who 
approached that statue and offered prayers and sought their identity, perhaps, would receive some kind of credit according to Hebrews 11.6. Do you yeah. think that that's... Yeah, in fact, that's one of the things they, they mention. So, um, and Paul even said, I've come to tell you the, the unknown God whom you... And that would be another he, instance, like with Peter and Cornelius, I've come to give you yeah, a better picture uh-huh. of what you already believe. Yeah, uh-huh, exactly. Um, so the, the examples are, these are people apart from special revelation of Israel, right? Job, Melchizedek, Jethro, Rahab, they would put them in that category. They didn't have any special revelation. They weren't like Abraham or Moses. They were apart from special revelation. So they were um, believing in God based on the light given to them. Okay, so they kind of put them in that category. The theological assumptions, I think we pretty much, general revelation is salvific when a person responds with faith in God. But the faith, remember, it's not just that God exists. So like Sam was saying, it would be more like these these, uh, people, it it does involve repentance. So they they recognize uh, God is creator. Oh, sorry. How do I get how do I get out of that? That's what I get for having having security on my computer. Okay. What was I saying? Okay, it's a faith that is includes, thank you, repentance and basically recognizing they are a sinner and casting themselves on God's mercy. So it's more involved than just saying that they believe, that they recognize that God exists. Demons recognize that God exists, but they don't trust or worship him, right? Um, so general revelation is salvific, but still unbelief in God is inexcusable. So those who don't seek God are still it's still Romans 118 holds. They're still without excuse. Um, so, you know, C.S. Lewis had this view, inclusivism. And by the way, there's different nuances. There's like, not a million, but, you know. There's several different, we put them in, in all in the bucket of inclusivism, but there's people who probably have nuanced views of inclusivism, right? And um, we're just not going over all those. Uh, Justin Martyr, Clement of Rome, John Wesley, C.S. Lewis, Clark Pinnock, N.T. Wright, Peter Kraft. So some, you know, this view is, is gaining ground and probably these people have some nuanced views of inclusivism. Any questions about inclusivism? Sam. It seems like we're dealing with um, some distinct populations and one of those populations is um, the people who have access to general revelation and do not have access to the gospel. Yeah. And let's say 0.01% or 10%. I imagine a different inclusivist would be inclined to give a different percent of that population responds positively to general revelation. Yeah. Would it, and then you introduce the gospel, that would then... Um, have an increased impact is on that on that people group yes yeah i get i would say yeah okay uh, in which case you haven't necessarily de-incentivized missions true okay yeah so one of the one of the um criticisms of inclusivism is that it sort of de-emphasizes missions and you don't want to do that because we have the great commission right so anything that would de-emphasize you evangelizing, it, you would have to go, mm, I don't know about that. But Sam's right. It, it doesn't, this doesn't mean human missionaries aren't going to unreached people. Have you ever heard of Don Richardson? He's a missionary. No? Oh, y'all. Do you ever read any missionary biographies? Okay, so Don Richardson goes to unreached people groups, and he he often finds that God has been there, (laughs) revealing himself in very 
distinct ways by giving them concepts in their tribe of gospel type things so that they, when they go and give the gospel, the people go, oh, well, kind of like, oh, so that's the unknown God we've been worshiping type of thing. Um, so if you read his books, that's very common. Um, but yeah. So I uh, mean, a little bit along those lines, uh, how would the inclusivist deal with, say, um, accounts and I put quite a few of like people who've had dreams in the Middle East that Jesus actually came to them and spoke. Yeah, we're getting or yeah accounts where in another village they've already heard the name Jesus because they've had a dream or a vision or something. To yeah, somebody. and actually that goes because more that into our last view, but yeah. That would seem to de-emphasize their view because it seems like God is specifically causing salvific things. He's directly, age. he's directly giving them the gospel. Yes, yeah, and th that would seem to de-emphasize their view because why would God bother? I mean, I don't know. Right. And one if, can argue the same thing with Cornelius. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Paul Cornelius and yeah. Too. Philip. And, yeah. and the the Ethiopian why, eunuch. Why would yeah. God send them more specific to those yeah. people and not? Just do that to everybody. Who's right, missing, right, right. He has the opportunity to offer special revelation. Yeah. Without. Yeah. Or why would he bother and, letting and, people? Have and actually, I would say, how do you not know he's not doing that? So, well, wait. Well, so we. The it, question would be, if if he is doing that, why is general revelation necessary for salvation? Because if they do accept the general revelation, why doesn't he immediately go dream, vision, etc.? Okay. To, you yeah. actually are stealing my joy Sorry. because uh -huh. that's the last. That's the last view. Okay, yeah. We're good. Uh huh. I have a question about the uh, repentance. Yeah. This yeah. View, because it's not just enough to believe that there's God like, exists. Yeah. One God. Because there's lots of cultures out there that have had like a sky god, for example. Yeah. Uh, like the Mongols, famously, Tinkers. You know, they believe something like there's a sky god, and that's like the main god or the one god. <laughs> but the practices of that religion are very different from what the Bible would prescribe. So, are those people in or out? They're in effect worshiping the one God. Right. They're not worshiping him as we would see the Well, one thing I would say is that pagan religions or even um, non Christian religions, non theistic religions, um, there's probably some truth in all. There, no, no religion is completely false, in other words, because we do, we are made in the image of God and we do have general revelation, right? So I don't think, I don't think it's good for Christians to say every view is completely false besides Christianity. So even the inclusivists would say that God is redemptively working in other religions, that this would be the view of some inclusivists. Um, to bring people to a knowledge of himself. Um, then again, there's the question of if the given ritual is counterproductive and yeah. practiced in a way that yeah. increases the distance. Right, right. I have a, I have a comment on this. So um, uh, C.S. Lewis is one of the advocates of this view. And yeah. there, there's an analogy that he gives in the Chronicles of Narnia that is, uh, like always brought up an example of this and what happens is essentially Aslan who's like the Jesus type he's just it's just a picture of Lewis's view uh, meets a character in the story who had been worshipping a false god and this god that he worshipped was actually like the god of death or something ridiculous terrible like that. Yeah. yeah and but the line in there that reflects Lewis's view and what captures what's going on here with the practices is he says the uh, worship or let's see here the evil worship that you gave to that god that god accepted but the good worship that you gave to that God, he wasn't worthy of, and I accepted on his behalf. Yeah. In other words, when he was worshiping this false God in truth, he was actually worshiping Aslan, as it were. But so actually, that character didn't follow the evil God in all of the right. ways. So it was distinctive about him that he used his reason, his rational capacity, to say, no, that's wrong. Remember, yeah. he didn't yeah. do everything the God yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah, exactly. Yeah, he, he didn't follow all, all, all of the evil uh, yeah. practices. But that's generally the idea is that a, a person who's worshiping, you know, like a yeah. sky god or something like that, on this view, they would say, insofar as they do true worship to a false god, that is actually accepted 
by Yahweh instead of the, the other yeah. God. So if you, do, do y'all know that story in the last battle, which is Chronicles of Narnia? But they never made that one into a movie. They, oh, they didn't? They stopped. Oh, okay, they so stopped. you have to read it, sorry. But that, that's the gist, what, what uh, Zach said is kind of the gist of C.S. Lewis's view of it. And that's this idea that God's working redemptively even through other religions. So, so it's kind of, mm, you go, mm, I don't know about that. So what are the, what, did we go over the, uh, the con- pros and cons? Yeah. We did? Oh, do we, we can't stop though, but we're discussing good, Andrew. We are discussing. Okay, so we're going to go to postmortem evangelism, which is a little quirky too, right? So, postmortem evangelism is those who die unevangelized receive an opportunity for salvation after death. In other words, no one is sa- no one is saved unless they have explicit knowledge of Christ. And it's not a second chance view, it's a first chance view. Only those who explicitly disbelieve in Christ will be condemned. That's a little bit different, right? Because remember on exclusivism and on inclusivism, if you reject general revelation, that's inexcusable and you would be damned. Um, So it's, it's not an indefinite offer. So it's an offer after in the afterlife, but it's not, doesn't extend forever. In the divine, in Dante's Inferno, yeah, uh, Dante passes through, and also presumably Jesus had passed through uh, limbo before entering hell, and he encountered the noble pagans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they presumably should have le- already left with Jesus, but they hadn't. I don't know why I brought that up, but now I'm just confused. Okay, so <laughs> never mind. Don't listen to him. Okay, <laughs> I don't know if that applies or not. But yeah, Dante had some had some not orthodox views, maybe. Right. Uh, because, because they were still in limbo, that probably wouldn't fall underneath this view. Maybe, yeah, because they're in they're in limbo, and maybe get a second get a second chance or a first chance. Okay. Yeah. So that that's something to remember. It's not a, it's not that everybody gets a second chance at it. It's that people who never hear the gospel get a first chance to hear the gospel. So the interesting about, thing about this one, pretty much all the proponents hang their hat on 1 Peter 3.18 through 4.6, which talks about Jesus descending to the spirits in prison and proclaiming to them, this is after he's, he, right before he's resurrected, this is during the three days. He descends to hell and pro- makes proclamation to the spirits now in prison who were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. Have y'all ever, heard, have y'all ever read that passage and go, huh, what? <laughs> yes, it does. Okay, so I, they hang their hat on that as, as evidence that you will get to hear, the, that you, you have a chance to hear the gospel after you die, okay, in the afterlife. And I want to just say they need to get a better verse is all I would say because this verse is very controversial and misinterpreted. So they, they actually have an interpretation that I think is very weak. And what I want to tell you is that, so this is where I, can't, I use Michael Heiser. He says something like, uh, if you find an obscure verse, that means it's very likely important. And so that's his business is to basically dig deep into the contextual uh, parts of the Bible that seem to be very obscure and weird and, and make them understandable in their context. So do you, do you want to know why this is a bad verse or are you going to take my word? Do you want to know? Okay, because we, 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 I think it's worth saying just so you know his view. And this is, this is I think, a uh, more, more uh, plausible view of this verse than what the postmortem evangelists say. Okay, does everybody remember in Genesis, Genesis 6 when the sons of God came down to the daughters of men and they corrupted all of human, uh, human beings and the, then the flood happened, right? 
Do you remember, do you remember that verse? It's weird too. And you go, huh, what? And there's lots of interpretations about it. But Michael Heiser puts the two together because Peter and Jude also, so we're talking about 1 Peter, but Jude has a lot of references to this also. Um, they're referencing this divine transgression. The sons of God were spirit beings who, who transgressed against human beings, corrupted human beings and before the flood. And they were, put, they were put in chains and held captive in hell. They still are, actually. They still are. And to await judgment. And there was intertestamental literature about this that explained a little more in the book of Enoch that was regularly read in Peter and Jude's audience. They had read this book of Enoch. So what they're doing in the scripture is tying this together to what their audience would have read. And it's something like this. Enoch, in that day, went down to where the spirits were captive to tell them they were, they were punished and condemned. And so for Peter, Jesus is the second Enoch. And just as Enoch descended to the imprisoned fallen angels to announce their doom, Jesus descended to the same spirits in prison to tell them that he had victory over them and they were still doomed. They were still defeated despite his crucifixion. So he's not going down there to share the gospel with them. So the, the question for this verse is, who are the spirits in prison and what is the proclamation? So on Heiser's view, the proclamation is that I have victory now, you're still defeated, and the spirits in prison are these, this, these spirits in prison are the ones from Genesis 6. Yeah? As, as a victory message over like the enemy that comes to war, which is the word, I think. Yeah. Evangelion, good news, kind of yeah. relating the victory over in battle. Yeah. Okay. So he's proclaiming and declaring victory in, in, the, in this instance. And so I just feel like after reading a lot about it, of course, almost the whole book, Unseen Realm, is about this, this idea and tying these things together. So if you really are interested in it, and it's very interesting, by the way. You need to borrow that book from me because he goes into much greater detail and supports it, makes a, a case for it. So how would these people interpret Cornelius? How would the, um, how would, what would they say about Cornelius? So they would say Cornelius was only saved after responding to the gospel. But if he died before Peter arrived, he would just hear the gospel after in the afterlife, right? And he would have a chance to hear the gospel and respond after he died. That's how they would respond to, to Cornelius. Okay, questions on that one? Yeah? What role does general revelation play in this view? So in this view, general revelation is not salvific, and it only condemns. So it's very similar. This view, it, a lot of its points are very similar to exclusivism, except for they, they require that every single person hears the gospel. And, and even God perseveres. In the afterlife, they hear the gospel, even if they haven't heard it. When you say that general revelation only condemns, does that mean that those who reject general revelation do not get the postmortem? No, revelation? they do. Because, I think they do because they can't be condemned just for not believing in God. They have to reject Jesus. So that's a little bit different. And it kind of makes it a bit more clear that general revelation on exclusivism claims to be, but is in no way, not at all, considered a first exposure or, or yeah. a legitimate. Yeah, yeah. Or, or is it, uh, has a role, I think, yeah. It, yeah. So, in their view, Christ descended to hell and offered salvation to, he offered it to everyone who was dead and in hell at that point? <laughs> well, that, that's not what that verse says, but that's what they extrapolate it to. Okay, I was just asking about that specific point, because I was looking, I knew that meant after Jesus died, but did they mean, like, when he, let me see. Yeah, when he descended into hell during the three days, I guess. Is that yeah. right, Zach? Am well, I saying that right? Oh, I, yeah, I have a comment. So there, there are two interrelated but, like, separate speculative theologies. 
this, there's a thing, again, called the harrowing of hell, which was a, a one-time event where Jesus descended into hell and did rescue some people, but that happened once. And then there's uh, the view that every single person at the moment of death meets Jesus, you know, immediately then. Um, and they're interrelated, but they're not necessarily the same thing. Ben would actually might have more comments because I know these are very common. Well, the final options. option view is a Catholic view that at the, not after death, but at the moment of death, you, you can um, respond to the gospel. Well, we are talking about that one. Well, we can. I mean, it's I'm one of the views. It's not one on your handout. I actually had a question on this, and just on your view on this, because I'm, I'm confused. When I, so when I first heard about a similar view to this was the context of Jehovah's Witnesses, because they hold, after soul sleep, they, the, everybody hears the same message, and uh -huh. then they have a chance to respond. So my initial response to that was a major, oh, that's heretical, you know, that's like totally wrong, yeah. uh, at least from a Catholic perspective. But the way you're explaining it, and makes me think that it has more, it has more of a chance of being acceptably orthodox. So, right. What, what is your thoughts like on a scale from Marcy on the top? <laughs> I think this one is the least. Well, you know, uh, just yeah. just so you know, it's okay not to land on a view tonight. All summer when I was reading, uh, what did I say? On Monday, Wednesday, I was uh, inclusivist. On Tuesday, Thursday, I was, you know, post-mortem. And then on Friday and Saturday, I was this last one. I mean, I was all over the place. Because uh, they can be a little, pers you know, they can be persuasive. But, they're, but I think the least persuasive one maybe is this one. Would you say there's any problems with it with orthodoxy, though? However you would define that? Like, could you... I just asked because the first time I heard it, I thought, I don't know if somebody could be a Christian. Well, the weird thing Christian. is, the strength of it is, let's see, the strength of it is, it strongly affirms universal ac accessible salvation, right? Because everybody gets a chance. And they affirm the necessity of an explicit faith in Christ, unlike the inclusivists. That's, that's a plus. But the weakness is their, their case for that you get a chance after death, right? That's, that's the weakness. That's the big hole. And it seems it's slightly different than just um, maybe, maybe you could have a flavor of this view that said somebody who is holy in their life will eventually discover after death that Jesus is the only way and have to accept that then but that that will only be given to those who, who were accept on that. a general revelation in this life. Right. Uh, that seems, it seems a bit yeah. easier for me to swallow if you phrase it. If, if you phrase it that way. way. The other thing you have to think about, it does de-emphasize missions, right? So you gotta go, hey, that's a real con, because right? Because nobody's gonna be because, a missionary as Jesus. To, like, okay, what? Explicit. Yeah. It just doesn't, to me, doesn't logically seem like it holds much water. Like, if you die and you're confronted with Jesus, and it's like, hey, do you want to go here? Do you want to go here? <laughs> it's it's kind of like, oh, I know this is real yeah. for sure because I'm experiencing it, so I want to yeah. go there. So right. somehow God would have to make it as a free a choice after death, which I don't know how that would be. And they don't explain how that would be, right? Yeah, it, had, it would have to be as free a choice as you yeah, could have here. Okay, we have five minutes. Don't you want to know the last few? Yeah? It's all good. Keep going. Okay, okay, so let's go. So the last view is universal evangelism. Okay, or I call it God sends the message. And it's kind of what um, Katie was saying. The view in a nutshell is if people seek God by responding to the light they have and the prompting of the Holy Spirit, God will send the message of Christ to them. God sees to it that all unevangelized persons who seek him will, in one way or the other, be exposed to the gospel so they can respond. God uses human agents for sure, dreams, visions, angels, anything he wants to use to directly influence, to uh, in, reveal himself. So the, the, I think the scriptures are a little bit similar to inclusivism. Uh, you know, they use the account of the Ethiopian eunuch where God sent Philip to him, the centurion, God sent Peter to him. And then also in the Old Testament, they just give a case for that God sometimes gets things done by communicating directly 
to people, either through dreams or visions or human messengers, that God does do that. It's not something he doesn't do. So it wouldn't be an exclusive thing that he only has to send the gospel through a human messenger. And like we said, in Muslim countries, when the gospel is not allowed, yeah, yeah, I know there's so many, you know, I mean, there's documented, you know, accounts where people do have visions of Jesus coming to them directly. OK, um, so on this view, it's very much like exclusivism because Jesus is the only way and you explicitly respond to the gospel too because it's it God sends you the gospel. Uh, general re- revelation is clear, but not salvific. So, so still general revelation doesn't save you. So they would say, just like the inclusivists, left to ourselves, we don't seek God, and we do suppress the truth from general revelation. But if the Holy Spirit is drawing everyone, a universal outreach, he is drawing people to seek God, and he uses general revelation to do that. So that's kind of the, the underlying assumption of this view. Um, seekers will find God, so it's not the case that, uh, just like I said, left to yourself you don't seek God, but uh, we seek God when we respond to the Holy Spirit, so we do find God when we're seeking. And on this view, salvation is universally accept- acceptable before death, so it's not an after-death thing. Um, so, yes? Uh, this view makes it seem like it's possible for Christianity to pop up in places before, like, any missionaries got there on their own, so, like, it could show up in South America. And it happens. People were trying to find it. You mean that, that they, 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 under, they know the gospel before a missionary comes? Yes. Actually, there are accounts of that. Yeah. Yeah. Which is very bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, well, why doesn't the inclusivist view not have a reason why those happen since they would say yeah. we don't even need them, but they seem to happen? Uh, I wanted to come back to um, your question and then if you still have it. Oh, uh, no, it was about the last thing, it doesn't matter. Oh, we can, we can come back to it because we're almost done with this one. For the pluses, you know, I think we said, but it does sort of de emphasize the need for human agents because God can work it in whichever way he wants, but, you st- but he still can work through human agents. So it's not as bad as the last view on that. Um, as far as Cornelius, God made sure Cornelius received the gospel message because Cornelius had responded in faith to the light given to him. That's how they would interpret Acts 10, right? So it almost seems like this is on a different level than the other views because this isn't necessarily making a claim as to what happens for a person who receives the gospel versus a person who only receives general revelation. It's making more of a claim of who is going to receive the gospel. Uh, so I kind of find that interesting. It's, it's, it's almost just making a claim about the nature of God. Yeah, because it feels like you could have universal evangelism and exclusivism be true at the same time because you say, oh, well, those who don't hear the gospel won't be saved. But Everyone will hear the gospel. Who wants to who, hear who, it? Who's seeking? Who's, right. Yeah, who desires yeah. to hear it? Yeah. So I just kind of thought that it was interesting. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So which is best? Which which three do you think? Um, I we're not here to tell you. You know, I'm sorry if you thought I was going to tell you what to believe, but I'm not because I'm still circling the airport. But this is a model you can use for sorting out debatable issues, just like this one. I think. But the key is to not just depend on the scripture support, but look at the assumptions behind the interpretation. So you have to look at what are the, the every theology, theologian has some assumptions they're going by, control beliefs that are influencing their interpretation. But I think that Carol the Christian has a reasonable response to Alvin that upholds the claims of Christianity concerning the exclusive nature of the gospel and the destiny of the unevangelized. She has something to say other than We just don't know, right? So even though Alvin might still be frustrated, I think he could see that that there could be harmonization with some of these views between the claims and we're not inconsistent. 
Um, so, but we can't be dogmatic. So if you believe one thing and your neighbor says, ah, I think it's the other one, we can't have dogmatic conclusions, but we can use critical reason to harmonize that Jesus is the only way and that God desires all people to be saved. Um, so the takeaway is that when evaluating competing views on debatable issues, which there's a lot of them, by the way, <laughs> in Christianity, we ha it's important to consider and evaluate the assumptions, the theological assumptions, it, because that guides the interpretation. And remember at Rosho Christi, this is what we aim to do, to give Alvin and all our skeptical and atheist friends intellectual permission to consider the gospel by answering these objections thoughtfully, like this one. So, oh, here's other small topics we can talk about at Rebs. <laughs> so we can talk about more about general revelation because I think that's a hot topic. Uh, we didn't talk about infants or the mentally disabled or universalism or the mental knowledge view, but all these are on the table, so to speak.